circle of death. Good evening. Welcome to Heavy D Storytelling. I'm David Sneathan, and I'm going to tell you a story. This is JJ, or he was just right here. JJ and Daniel behind him. Kimmy's in her room. Mom's in the other room. Here we are. We're going to start with Psalm, or Proverbs, rather. And we missed yesterday, so we're going to start with Proverbs chapter 24. Be not envious of evil men, nor desire to be with them, for their hearts devise violence, and their lips talk of trouble. By wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. My, my uh, screen is flashing. I'm not sure what that's about. I did get a notification that I'm live. But my screen is flashing. It's kind of glitchy. So if you're having glitchy issues, let me know. I'm going to start over at verse 3. By wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. By knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. A wise man is full of strength, and a man of knowledge enhances his might. For by wise guidance you can wage your war, and in abundance of counselors there is victory. Wisdom is too high for a fool in the gate he does not open his mouth. Whoever plans to do evil will be called a schemer. The devising of folly is sin, and the scoffer is an abomination to mankind. You see no glitches. That's good. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, Behold, we did not know this, does, he, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will he not repay man according to his work? My son, eat honey, for it is good, and the drippings of the honeycomb are sweet to your taste. Know that wisdom is such to your soul. If you find it, there will be no future. There will be a future, and your hope will not be cut off. Lie not in wait as a wicked man against the dwelling of the righteous. Do no violence to his home, for the righteous falls seven times and rises again, but the wicked stumble in times of calamity. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and let not your heart be glad when he stumbles, lest the Lord see it and be displeased and turn away his anger from him. Fret not yourself because of evil doers. And be not envious of the wicked, for the evil man has no future. The lamp of the wicked will be put out. My son, fear the Lord and the king, and do not join with those who do otherwise. For disaster will arise suddenly from them, and who knows the ruin that will come from them both. These also are sayings of the wise. Partiality in judging is not good. Whoever says to the wicked, you are in the right, will be cursed by peoples, abhorred by nations. But those who rebuke the wicked will have delight, and a good blessing will come upon them. Whoever gives an honest answer kisses the lips. Prepare your work outside, get everything ready for yourself in the field, and after that build your house. Be not a witness against your neighbor without cause, and do not deceive without, with your lips. Do not say, I will do to him as he has done to me. I will pay the man back for what he has done. I passed by the field of a sluggard, by the vineyard of a man lacking sense, and behold, it was all overgrown with thorns. The ground was covered with nettles, and its stone wall was broken down. Then I saw and considered it, and I looked and received instruction a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man, an armed man. And so now we're, that was chapter 24 since we missed yesterday, and now we're going to come in with chapter 25. This is Proverbs chapter 25 since today is April the 25th. These are the Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied. It is the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings is to search things out. As the heavens for height and the earth for depth, 
so the heart of kings is unsearchable. Take away the dross from the silver, and the smith has material for a vessel. Take away the wicked from the presence of the king, and his throne will be established in righteousness. Do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great, for it is better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. What your eyes have seen, do not hastily bring into court, for what will you do in the end when your neighbor puts you to shame? Argue your case with your neighbor himself and do not reveal another secret, lest he who hears you bring shame upon you and your ill repute have no end. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver, like a gold ring or an ornament of gold is a wise reprover to a listening ear, like the cold of snow in the time of harvest is a faithful messenger to those who send him, he refreshes the soul of his masters. Like clouds and wind without rain is a man who boasts of a gift he does not give. With patience a ruler may be persuaded and a soft tongue will break a bone. If you have found honey, eat only enough for you, lest you have your fill of it and vomit it. Let your foot be seldom in your neighbor's house, lest he have his fill of you and hate you. A man who bears false witness against his neighbor is like a war club or a sword or a sharp arrow. Trusting in a treacherous man in time of trouble is like a bad tooth or a foot that sleeps. Whoever sings songs to a heavy heart is like one who takes off a garment on a cold day and like vinegar on soda. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat, and if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. If you will heap, for you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. The north wind brings forth rain, and a backbiting tongue angry looks. It is better to live in a corner of the housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. Like cold water to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. Like a muddied spring or a polluted fountain is a righteous man who gives way before the wicked. It is not good to eat much honey, nor is it glorious to seek one's own glory. A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. That is Proverbs chapter 25. This is the English Standard Version of the Bible. And Ben told me they're done with uh, watching Walking Garbage. So, and I've got glitchy uh, screen. Let me know. Uh, Mom says she has no glitches, but Rebecca, if you have glitches, let me know. Um, I definitely have glitches. It's like flashing every five or 10 seconds and it's a little bit distracting, but it is what it is. Um, so since it's been two days since we've read the story, um, I thought it was kind of important to try to do a synopsis. Kimberly, are you up for a synopsis tonight? Yeah. Here she is. Here comes Kimberly. Oh, wait, on that. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, I saw it. <laughs> I keep seeing you in the picture and then me again. <laughs> That's weird. Okay, but anyway, the last few chapters. Um, <sighs> no. No. Um, Eustace, um, um, Truffle, no, I keep forgetting all the names, sorry. Uh, Eustace, Jill, and Puddleglum. Okay, sorry, too many. <laughs> he thinks he's enthusiastic, but he's like, Oh no, the world is ending. Here's the bright side. We won't have to be eaten by the giants if the world ends. <laughs> Okay, so um they all they all um, maybe in the movie. 
Okay, so uh, what happens is they decide to go out over to the ruined city that they saw from from um, Jill's window, and then so they go over to the kitchen where there's a door, and they see this book. So Jill, she's curious about the book, so she reads it, and the second entry said something about cooking humans. And then the third was about um, marsh wiggles, right? Yep. That's what they're called. Okay, so um, so when the cook is snoring, they run out and literally seconds before the hunting party comes back and they have a big chase and Jill is the last one into the hiding spot where they find in the giant stepping stairs. And there's a little crack. Daniel said it's Mars Wiggles, not Mars Wiggles. Mars Wiggles, not He's saying Mosh Wiggles. <laughs> She's trying to do it for Miami. Yeah, I know. Okay, go ahead. Okay, but so what happens then? is they go down and um, they go down the tunnel because they found a tunnel at the end of the crack. So they decide to go down and then they slide down a huge slide. And after a few minutes of just sliding, um, a person, like they stop and a person says um, something like, who are you? Um, oh, and they are the no. They say, who are you above landers? We are the Over, under overlanders. Okay, overlanders. We underlanders, right? Yeah, we underlanders have a hundred men and we're gonna attack you if you're hostile. So that's basically what they said. In a nutshell, I guess. But so then after that they um after that they go over with the guys and they saw the black knight from earlier and he was like oh hey i remember you guys and they were like hey you're the black knight with the no it took them a while no they it took a while and then they had to go through small crevices and cracks in the ground, and then they had to go through an underwater river, and then they saw this giant town. What they only saw little windows in the town that were um, above ground. Most of it was like cut out of rock or something. So um, and they were like, "Oh hey, you were the person with the green lady." Who told us to go to the giants and we almost got eaten because of it and then he was like what i didn't know that and how dare you say that the green lady told you to go over to here go over there to get eaten by giants and then they were like um okay sorry and he was like um i'll tell you my story of how i met the green lady and that's that that's where we are Something like that. All right. So that's where we are. I am going to try really hard. Ben told me he was going to try to be here, but he is not here. And I. All right. Somebody, somebody get on. Chastise Ben on the Seabin chat. Okay. This is chapter 11. And let me just look real fast how many chapters we have. I want to see if we can try to finish tomorrow is my goal. 16. So that would be three today and three tomorrow. If we get three today, then we can finish tomorrow. Okay. Chapter 11, In the Dark Castle. I'll try to read fast. I know we're already at almost 15 minutes and we're just starting. Okay. <clears throat> when the meal is a pigeon pie. Oh, there's the Stephen chat. Okay. Just a minute. Ben, 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 live stream now. Okay, perfect. 
When the meal, which was pigeon pie, cold ham, salad, and cakes, had been brought and all had drawn their chairs up to the table and begun, the night continued. You must understand, friends, that I know nothing of who I was and whence I came into this dark world. I remember no time when I was not dwelling, as now, at the court of this all but heavenly queen. By my thought is that, but my thought is that she saved me from some evil enchantment and brought me hither of her exceeding bounty. Honest, Frogfoot, your cup is empty. Suffer me to refill it. And this seems to me the likelier, because even now I am bound by a spell from which my lady alone can free me. Every night there comes an hour when my mind is most horribly changed, and after my mind, my body. For first I become furious and wild, and would rush upon my dearest friends to kill them if I were not bound, and soon after that I turn into the likeness of a great serpent, Hungry, fierce, and deadly. Sir, be pleased to take another another breast of pigeon, I entreat you. So they tell me, and they certainly speak truth, for my lady says the same. I myself know nothing of it, for when my hour is past, I awake forgetful of all that vile fit, and in my proper shape and sound mind, saving that I am somewhat wearied. Little lady, eat one of those honey cakes which are brought for me from some barbarous land in the far north of the world. Now the queen's majesty knows by her art that I shall be freed from this enchantment when once she has made me king of a land in the overworld and set its crown upon my head. The land is already chosen and the very place of our breaking out. Her earthmen have worked day and night digging away beneath it and have now gone so far and so high that they tunnel not score of feet beneath the very grass the updwellers of that country walk. It will be very soon now that those uplanders fate will come upon them. She herself is at the diggings tonight and I expect a message to go to her. The then the thin roof of earth, which still keeps me from my kingdom, will be broken through, and with her to guide me, and a thousand earthmen at my back, I shall ride forth in arms, fall suddenly on our enemies, slay their chief men, cast down their strong places, and doubtless be their crowned king within four and twenty hours. A bit of rough luck on them, isn't it? said Scrub. Thou art a lad of wondrous quick-working wit, exclaimed the knight, for on my honor I had never thought of it so before. I see your meaning. He looked slightly, very slightly troubled for a moment or two, but his face soon cleared and he broke out with another of his loud laughs. But fie on gravity! Is it not the most comical and ridiculous thing in the world to think of them all going about their business? and never dreaming that under their peaceful fields and floors, only a fathom down, there is a great army ready to break out upon them like a fountain, and they never to have, they never to have suspected. That's a sentence, and they never to have expected. Why, they themselves, when once the first smart of their defeat is over, can hardly choose but laugh at the thought. I don't think it's funny at all, said Jill. I think you'll be a wicked tyrant. What? said the knight, still laughing and patting her head in quite an infuriating fashion. Is our little maid a deep politician? But never fear, sweetheart. In ruling that land, I shall do all by the counsel of my lady, who will then be my queen too. Her word shall be my law, even as my word will be law to the people we have conquered. Where I come from, said Jill, who was disliking him more every minute. They don't think much of men who are bossed about by their wives. Shalt think otherwise when thou hast a man of thine own, I warrant you, said the knight, apparently thinking this very funny. But with my lady, it is another matter. I am well content to live by her word, who has already saved me from a thousand dangers.
Looks like Ben is here finally. Yay, thank you. Nice to see you, Ben. Yeah, yeah. Thousand dangers. No mother has taken pains more tenderly for her child than the Queen's Grace has for me. Why look, amid all her cares and business, she rideth out with me in the overworld many a time and oft to accustom my eyes to the sunlight. And then I must go fully armed and with visor down so that no man may see my face and I must speak to no one. For she had found out by art magical that this would hinder my deliverance from the grievous enchantment I lie under. Is not that a lady worthy of a man's whole worship? Sounds a very nice lady indeed. Oh, sorry, that's Puddleglum. Sounds a very nice lady indeed, said Puddleglum in a voice which meant exactly the opposite. They were thoroughly tired of the night's talk before they had finished supper. Puddleglum was thinking, I wonder what game that witch is really playing with this young fool. Scrub was speaking, was thinking. He's a great baby, really, tied to that woman's apron, apron strings. He's a sap. And Jill was thinking, he's the silliest, most conceited, selfish pig I've met for a long time. But when the meal was over, the knight's mood had changed. There was no more laughter about him. Friends, he said. My honor is now very near. I am ashamed that you should see me, yet I dread being left alone. My hour, my hour is now very near. I said honor, didn't I? Oh, well. Uh, they will come in presently and bind me hand and foot to yonder chair. Alas, so it must be, for in my fury, they tell me, I would destroy all that I could reach. I say, said Scrub, I'm awfully sorry about your enchantment, of course, but what will those fellows do to us when they come to bind you? They talked of putting us in prison, and we don't like all the dark places very much. We'd much rather stay here till you're, you're better, if we may. It is well thought of, said the knight. By custom, none but the queen herself remains with me in my evil hour. Such is her tender care for my honor that she would not willingly suffer any ears but her own to hear the words I utter in that frenzy, but I could not easily persuade my attendant gnomes that you should be left with me, and I think here their soft feet even now upon the stairs. Go through yonder door, it leads into my other apartments, and there either await my, com my coming when they have unbound me, or, if you will, return and sit with me in my ravings. They followed his directions and passed out of the room by a door which they had not yet seen opened. It brought them, they were pleased to see, not into darkness, but into a lighted corridor. They tried various doors and found what very badly needed water for washing, water for washing, what they very badly needed, water for washing and even a looking glass. He never offered us a wash before supper, said Jill, drying her face. Selfish, self-centered pig. Are we going back to watch the enchantment or shall we stay here? Stay here, I vote, said Jill. I'd much rather not see it. But she felt a little inquisitive all the same. Nope, go back, said Puddleglum. We may pick up some information, and we need all we can get. I am sure that queen is a witch and an enemy, and those earthmen would knock us on the head as soon as look at us. There's a stronger smell of danger and lies and magic and treason about this land that I have ever smelled before. We need to keep our eyes and our ears open. They went back down the corridor and gently pushed the door open. It's all right, said Scrub, meaning that there were no earthmen about. Then they all came back into the room where they had supped. The main door was now shut, concealing the curtain between which they had first entered. The knight was seated in a curious silver chair to which he was bound by his ankles, his knees, his elbows, his wrists, and his waist. There was a sweat on his forehead and his face was filled with anguish. Come in, friends, he said, glancing quickly up. The fit is not yet upon me. Make no noise. 
for I told that prying chamberlain that you were in bed. Now I can feel it coming. Quick, listen while I master, while I am master of myself. When the fit is upon me, it may well be that I shall beg and implore you with entreaties and threatenings to loosen my bonds. They say I do. I shall call upon you by all that is most dear and most dreadful, but do not listen to me. Harden your hearts and stop your ears, for while I am bound, you are safe. But if once I were up and out of this chair, then first would come my fury, and after that, he shuddered, to change into a loathsome serpent. There's no fear of our loosing you, said Puddleglum. We've no wish to meet wild men or serpents either. I should think not, said Scrub and Jill together. All the same, added Puddleglum in a whisper, don't let's be too sure. Let's be on our guard. We've muffed everything else, you know. He'll be cunning, I shouldn't wonder, once he gets started. Can we trust one another? Do we all promise that whatever he says, we don't touch those cords? Whatever he says, mind you, rather, said Scrub. There's nothing in the world he can say or do that'll make me change my mind, said Jill. Hush, something's happening, said Puddleglum. The knight was moaning. His face was as pale as putty, and he writhed in his bonds. And whether because she was sorry for him or for some other reason, Jill thought that he looked a nicer sort of man than he had looked before. Ah, he groaned, enchantments, enchantments, the heavy, tangled, cold, clammy web of evil magic, buried alive, dragged down under the earth, down into the sooty blackness. How many years is it? Have I lived ten years or a thousand years in the pit? Maggot men all around me. Oh, have mercy, let me out, let me go back. Let me feel the wind in the sky. There used to be a little pool. When you looked down into it, you could see all the trees growing upside down in the water, all green and below them deep, very deep in the blue sky. And the blue sky. He had been speaking in a low voice. Now he looked up, fixed his eyes upon them, and said loud and clear, Quick, I am sane now. Every night I am sane. If only I could get out of this enchanted chair, it would last. I should be a man again, but every night they bind me, and so every night my chance is gone. But you are not enemies. I am not your prisoner. Quick, cut these cords. Stand fast, steady, said Puddleglum to the two children. I beseech you to hear me, said the knight, forcing himself to speak calmly. Have they told you that I am released from this chair? If I am released from this chair, I shall kill you and become a serpent. I see by your faces that they have. It's a lie. It is at this hour that I am in my right mind. It is all the rest of the day that I am enchanted. You are not earthmen nor witches. Why should you be on their side of your courtesy? Cut my bonds. Steady, 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 said the three travelers to one another. I, I see Dardar here saying, steady. Steady. Sorry, in the in the Battle of Naboo. Okay, sorry. Um, oh, you have hearts of stone, said the knight. Believe me, you look upon a wretch who has suffered almost more than any mortal can bear. What wrong have I ever done you that you should side with my enemies to keep me in such miseries? And the minutes are slipping past. Now you can save me. When this hour has passed, I shall have I shall be witless again. The toy and lapdog, nay, more likely the pawn and tool of the most devilish sorceress that ever planted the woe of men. And this night of all nights when she is away, you have taken me a chance that may never come again. This is dreadful. I do wish we'd stayed away till it was over, said Jill. Steady, said Puddleglum. The prisoner's voice was now rising into a shriek. Let me go, I say. Give me my sword, my sword. Once I am free, I shall take such revenge on Earthmen that Underland will talk of it for a thousand years. 
now the frenzy is beginning, said the scrub. I hope those knots are all right. Yes, Puddle Glum. He'd have twice his natural strength if he got free now, and I'm not clever with my sword. He'd get us both. I shouldn't wonder, and then Pole on her own would be left to tackle the snake. The prisoner now was the prisoner was now so straining in, at his bonds that they cut into his wrists and ankles. Beware, he said, beware, one night I did break them, but the witch was there that time. You will not have her to help you tonight. Free me now, and I am your friend. I'm your mortal enemy, else. Cunning, isn't he? said Puddle Glum. Once and for all, said the prisoner, I adjure you to set me free. By all fears and all loves, by the bright skies of Overland, by the great lion, by Aslan himself, I charge you. Oh, said the three travelers, as though they had been hurt. It's the sign, said Puddleglum. It was the words of the sign, said Scrub more cautiously. Oh, what are we to do, said Jill. It was a dreadful question. What had been the use of promising one another that they would not on any account set the knight free if they were now to do so the first time he had happened to call upon a name they really cared about? On the other hand, what had been the use of learning the signs if they weren't going to obey them? Yet, could Aslan have really meant them to unbind anyone, even a lunatic who asked it in his name? Could it be a mere accident, or how, if the queen of the underworld knew all about the signs and had made the knight learn this name simply in order to entrap them, but then supposing this the real sign? They had muffed three already. They daren't muff the fourth. Here is a picture of the prince in the silver chair with Puddle Glum and the two children. Let's find out what happens. Oh, if only we knew, said Jill. I think we do know, said Puddle Glum. Do you mean you think everything will come right if we... If we do untie him, said Scrub. I don't know about that, said Puddleglum. You see, Aslan didn't tell Pole what would happen. He only told her what to do. That fellow will be the death of us once he's up. I shouldn't wonder, but that doesn't let us off following the sign. They all stood looking at one another with bright eyes. It was a sickening moment. All right, said Jill suddenly. Let's get it over. Goodbye, everyone. They all shook hands. The knight was screaming by now. There was foam on his cheeks. Come on, Scrub, said Puddleglum. He and Scrub drew their swords and went over to the captive. In the name of Aslan, they said, and began methodically cutting the cords. The instant the prisoner was free, he crossed the room in a single bound, seized his own sword, which had been taken from him and laid on the table, and drew it. You first, he cried, and fell upon the silver chair. That must have been a good sword. The silver gave way before its edge like string, and in a moment a few twisted fragments shining on the floor were all that was left. But as the chair broke, there came from it a bright flash, a sound like small thunder, and, for one moment, a loathsome smell. Lie there, vile engine of sorcery, he said, lest your mistress should ever use you for another victim. Then he turned and surveyed his rescuers, and the something wrong, whatever it was, had vanished from his face. What, he cried, turning to Puddle Glum, do I see before me a Marshwiggle, a real, live, honest, Narnian Marshwiggle? Oh, so you have heard of Narnia after all, said Jill. Had I forgotten it when I was under the spell, asked the knight. Well, that and all other bedevilments are now over. You may well believe that I know Narnia, for I am Rillian, 
prince of Narnia, and Caspian the great king is my father. Your royal highness, said Puddleglums, sinking on one knee, and the children did the same. We have come hither for no other end than to seek you. And who are you, my other deliverers, said the prince to Scrub and Jill. We were sent by Aslan himself from beyond the world's end to seek your highness, said Scrub. I am Eustace, who sailed with him to the island of Ramandu. I owe all three of you a greater debt than I can ever pay, said Prince Brilliant. But my father, is he yet alive? He sailed east again before we left Narnia, my lord, said Puddleglum. But your highness must consider that the king is very old. It is ten to one. His majesty must die on the voyage. He is old, you say. How long, has, how long then have I been in the power of the witch? It is more than ten years since your highness was lost in the woods at the north side of Narnia. Ten years, said the prince, drawing his hand across his face as if to rub away the past. Yes, I believe you, for now that I am myself, I can remember that enchanted life, though while I was enchanted, I could not remember my true self. And now, fair friends, but wait, I hear their feet. Does it not sicken a man that padding woolen, woolly tread? So, on the stairs, lock the door, boy, or stay. I have a better thought than that. I will fool these earthmen if Aslan gives me the wit. Take your cue from me. He walked resolutely to the door and flung it wide open. Chapter 12 is called The Queen of Underland. Two earthmen entered, but instead of advancing into the room, they placed themselves one on each side of the door and bowed deeply. They were followed immediately by the last person whom anyone had expected or wished to see, the Lady of the Green Kirtle, the Queen of the Underland. She stood dead still in the doorway, and they could see her eyes moving as she took in the whole situation. The three strangers, the silver chair destroyed, and the prince free with his sword in his hand. She turned very white, but Jill thought it was the sort of whiteness that comes over some people's faces, not when they are frightened, but when they are angry. For a moment, the witch fixed her eyes on the prince, and there was murder in them. Then she seemed to change her mind. Leave us, she said to the two earthmen, and let none disturb us till I call on pain of death. The gnomes padded away obediently, and the witch king shut and locked the door. How now, my lord prince, she said. Has your nightly fit not yet come upon you, or is it over so soon? Why stand you here unbound? Who are these aliens, and is it they who have destroyed the chair which was your only safety? Prince William shivered as she spoke to him. And no wonder it is not easy to throw off in half an hour an enchantment which has made one a slave for ten years. Then, speaking with a great effort, he said, Madam, there will be no more need of that chair, and you, who have told me a hundred times how deeply you pitied me for the sorceries by which I was bound, will doubtless hear with joy that they are now ended forever. There was, it seems, some small error in your ladyship's way of treating them. These, my true friends, have delivered me. I am now in my right mind, and there are two things I will say to you. First, as for your ladyship's design of putting me at the head of an army of earthmen, that so I may break out into the overworld and there, by main force, make myself king over some nation that never did me wrong, murdering their natural lords and holding their throne as a bloody and foreign tyrant. Now that I know myself, I do utterly abhor and renounce it as plain villainy. And second, I am the king's son of Narnia, William, the only child of Caspian, tenth of that name, 
whom some shall call Caspian the seafarer. Therefore, madam, it is my purpose, as it is also my duty, to depart suddenly from your highness's court into my own country. Please it, you, to, please it to grant me and my friends safe conduct and a guide through your dark realm. Now the witch said nothing at all, but moved gently across the room, always keeping her face and eyes very steadily toward the prince. When she had come to a little ark set in the wall not far from the fireplace, she opened it and took out first a handful of green powder. This she threw on the fire. It did not blaze much, but a very sweet and drowsy smell came from it. And all through the conversation which followed, that smell grew stronger and filled the room and made it harder to think. Secondly, she took out a musical instrument, rather like a mandolin. She began to play it with her fingers, a steady, monotonous thrumming that you didn't notice it after a few minutes. But the less you noticed it, the more it got into your brain and your blood. This also made it hard to think. After she had thrummed for a time and the sweet smell was now strong, she began speaking in a sweet, quiet voice. Narnia, she said, Narnia, I have often heard of your lordship utter that name in your ravings. Dear prince, you are very sick. There is no land called Narnia. Yes, there is, though, ma'am, said Puddleglum. You see, I happen to have lived there all my life. Indeed, said the witch. Tell me, I pray you, where that country is. Up there, said Puddleglum, stoutly, pointing overhead. I, I don't know exactly where. How, said the queen, with a kind of soft musical laugh, is there a country up among the stones and mortal on the roof? Nope, said Puddleglum, struggling a little to get his breath. It's an overworld. And what or where, pray, is this? How do you call it? Overworld? Oh, don't be so silly, said Scrub, who was fighting hard against the enchantment of the sweet smell and the thrumming, as if you didn't know. It's up above, up where you can see the sky and the sun and the stars. Why, you've been there yourself. We met you there. I cry you mercy, little brother, laughed the witch. You couldn't have heard a lovelier laugh. I have no memory of that meeting, but we often meet our friends in strange places when we dream, and unless all dreamed alike, you must not ask them to remember it. Madam, said the prince sternly, I have already told your grace that I am the king's son of Narnia. And shalt be, dear friend, said the witch, in a soothing voice, as if she was humoring a child, shalt be king of many imagined lands in thy fancies. We've been there too, snapped Jill, she was very angry, because she could feel enchantment getting hold of her every moment, but of course the very fact that she could still feel it showed that she had not yet that it not had that it had not yet fully worked. And thou art queen of Narnia too? I doubt not, pretty one, said the witch in the same coaxing, half mocking tone. I'm nothing of the sort, said Jill, stamping her foot. We come from another world. Why, this is a prettier game than the other, said the witch. Tell us, little maid, where is this other world? What ships and chariots go between it and ours? Of course, a lot of things darted into Jill's head at once. Experiment House, Adela Pennyfather, her own home, radio sets, cinemas, cars, airplanes, ration, ration books, cues, but they seemed dim and far away. Thrum, thrum, thrum went the strings of the witch's instrument. Jill couldn't remember the names of the things in our world, and this time it didn't come into her head that she was being enchanted, for now the magic was in its full strength, and of course 
the more enchanted you get, the more you feel that you are not enchanted at all. She found herself saying, and at the moment it was a relief to say, No, I suppose that the other world must be all a dream. Yes, it is all a dream, said the witch, always thrumming. Yes, all a dream, said Jill. There never was such a world, said the witch. No, said Jill and Scrub. Never was such a world. There never was any world but mine, said the witch. There never was any world but yours, said they. Puddleglum was still fighting hard. Before we get to Puddleglum, I'm going to show a picture of the green lady playing her mandolin. There she is. Kimmy's coming out to see what a mandolin is. What the heck? It is sort of like a weird guitar. Yep, okay, here's Daniel looking at it from a distance. Okay, perfect. You can look at this book any time. Gosh. Puddleglum was still fighting hard. I don't know rightly what you all mean by a world, he said, talking like a man who hasn't enough air. But you can play that fiddle till your fingers drop off. And still you won't make me forget Narnia. And the whole overworld, too. We'll never see it again, I shouldn't wonder. You may have blotted it out and turned it dark like this, for all I know. Nothing more likely. But I know I was there once. I've seen the sky full of stars. I've seen the sun coming up out of the sea of a morning and sinking behind the mountains at night. And I've seen him up in the midday sky when I couldn't look at him for brightness. Puddleglum's words had a very rousing effect. The other three all breathed again and looked at one another like people newly awake. Why, there it is, cried the prince, of course. The blessing of Aslan upon the honest marsh wiggle. We have all been dreaming these last few minutes. How could we have forgotten it? Of course we've all seen the sun. By Jove, so we have, said Scrub. For good for you, Puddleglum. You're the only one of us with any sense, I do believe. Then came the witch's voice, cooing softly like the voice of a wood pigeon from the high elms in an old garden at three o'clock in the middle of the sleepy summer afternoon, and it said, What is this sun that you speak of? Do you mean anything by this word? Yes, we jolly well do, said Scrub. Can you tell me what it's like? asked the witch. Thrum, 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 went the strings. Please, please it, your grace, said the prince, very coldly and politely. You see that lamp? It is round and yellow and gives light to the whole room and hangeth moreover from the roof. Now that thing which we call the sun is like the lamp, only far greater and brighter. It gives light to the whole overworld and hangeth in the sky. Hangeth from what, my lord? asked the witch. And then, while they were all still thinking how to answer her, she added with another of her soft silver laughs. You see, when you try to think out clearly what this sun must be, you cannot tell me. You can only tell me it is like the lamp. Your sun is a dream, and there is nothing in that dream that was not copied from the lamp. The lamp is the real thing. The sun is but a tale, a children's story. Yes, I... I see it now, said Jill in a heavy, hopeless tone. It must be so. And while she said this, it seemed to her to be very good sense. Slowly and gravely, the witch repeated, There is no sun. And they all said nothing. She repeated in a softer and deeper voice, There is no sun. After a pause, and after a struggle in their minds, all four of them said together, You are right. There is no sun. It was such a relief to give in and say it. There never was a sun, said the witch. 
No, there never was a son, said the prince and the marsh wiggle and the children. For the last few minutes, Jill had been feeling that there was something she must remember at all costs, and now she did, but it was dreadfully hard to say it. She felt as if huge weights were laid on her lips. At last, with an effort that seemed to take all the good out of her, she said, There's Aslan. Aslan? said the witch, quickening ever so slightly the pace of her swimming. What a pretty name. What does it mean? He's the great lion who called us out of our own world, said Scrub, and sent us into this to find Prince Rillian. What is a lion? asked the witch. Oh, hang it all, said Scrub. Don't you know? How can we describe it to her? Have you ever seen a cat? Surely, said the queen. I love cats. Well, a lion is a little bit, only a little bit, mind you, like a huge cat with a mane. At least it's not like a horse's mane, you know. It's more like a judge's wig, and it's yellow and ter ter terrifically, ter terrifically, golly, wow. And I'm fired, all right. <laughs> and, and, terri and terrifically strong. The witch shook her head. I see, she said that we should do no better with your lion, as you call it, than we did with your son. You have seen lamps, and so you imagined a bigger and better lamp and called it the sun. You've seen cats, and now you want a bigger and better cat, and it's to be called a lion. Well, tis a pretty make-believe, though, to say the truth, it would suit you all better if you were younger. And look how you can put nothing into your make-believe without copying it from the real world, this world of mine, which is the only world. But even if you children are too old for such play, as for you, my lord prince, that art a man full grown, fie upon you. Are you not ashamed of such toys? Come, all of you, put away these childish tricks. I have work for you all in the real world. There is no Narnia, only, no, sorry. There is no Narnia, no overworld, no sky, no sun, no Aslan. And now, to bed all and let us begin a wiser life tomorrow. But first to bed, to sleep, deep sleep, soft pillows, sleep without foolish dreams. The prince and the two children were standing with their heads hung down, their cheeks flushed, their eyes half closed, the strength all gone from them, the enchantment almost complete. But Puddleglum, desperately gathering all his strength, walked over to the fire. Then he did a very brave thing. He knew it wouldn't hurt him quite as much as it would hurt a human, for his feet, which were bare, were webbed and hard and cold-blooded like a duck's. But he knew it would hurt him badly enough, and so it did. With his bare foot, he stamped on the fire, grinding a large part of it into ashes on the flat hearth, and three things happened at once. First, the sweet, heavy smell grew very much less, for though the whole fire had not been put out, a good bit of it had, and what remained smelled very largely of burnt marsh wiggle, which is not at all an enchanting smell. This instantly made everyone's brain far clearer. The prince and the children held up their hands again and opened their eyes. Secondly, the witch, in a loud, terrible voice, utterly different from all the sweet tones she had been using up until now, called out, What are you doing? Dare to touch my fire again, mud and filth, and I'll turn the blood to fire inside your veins. Thirdly, the pain itself made Puddleglum's head for a moment perfectly clear, and he knew exactly what he really thought. There is nothing like a good shock of pain for dissolving certain kinds of magic. One word, ma'am, 
he said, coming back from the fire, limping because of the pain. One word, all you've been saying is quite right. I shouldn't wonder. I'm a chap who always liked to know the worst and then put the best face I can on it. So I won't deny any of what you said. But there's one thing more to be said even so. Suppose we have only dreamed or made up all those things, trees and grass and sun and moon and stars and Aslan himself. Suppose we have. Then all I can say is that in that case, the made-up things seem a good deal more important than the real ones. Suppose this black pit of a kingdom of yours is the only world. Well, it strikes me as a pretty poor one. And that's a funny thing when you come to think of it. We're just babies making up a game, if you're right. But four babies playing a game can only make a play world which licks your real world hollow. That's why I'm going to stand by the play world. I'm on Aslan's side, even if there isn't any Aslan to lead it. I'm going to live as like a Narnian as I can, even if there isn't a Narnia. So thanking you kindly for our supper, if these two gentlemen and the young lady are ready, we're leaving your court at once and setting out in the dark to spend our lives looking for our overland. Not that our lives will be very long, I should think. Small loss if the world's as dull a place as you say. Oh, hurrah! Good old Buttleglum, cried Scrub and Jill. The prince shouted suddenly, Where? Look to the witch! When they did look, their hair nearly stood on end. The instrument dropped from her hands. Her arms appeared to be fastened to her sides. Her legs were intertwined with each other, and her feet had disappeared. The long green train of her skirt thickened and grew solid, and seemed to be all one piece with the writhing green pillar of her interlocked legs. And that writhing green pillar was curving and swaying as if it had no joints or else were all joints. Her head was thrown far back. And while her nose grew longer and longer, every other part of her face seemed to disappear except her eyes. Huge flaming eyes they were now without brows or lashes. All this takes time to write down. It happened so quickly that there was only just time to see it. Long before there was time to do anything, the change was complete. And the great serpent, which the witch had become, green as poison, thick as Jill's waist, had flung two or three coils of its loathsome body round the prince's legs, Quick as lightning, another great loop darted round, intending to pinion his sword arm to his side. But the prince was just in time. He raised his arms and got them clear. The living knot closed only round his chest, ready to crack his ribs like firewood when it drew tight. The prince put the creature's neck in his left hand, trying to squeeze it till he choked. This held its face, if you could call it a face, about five inches from its own. The forked tongue flickered horribly in and out, but could not reach him. With his right hand, he drew back his sword for the strongest blow he could give. Meanwhile, Scrubs and Puddleglum, Scrub and Puddleglum had drawn their weapons and rushed to his aid. All three blows fell at once. Scrub, Scrubs, which did not even pierce the scales and did no good, on the body of the snake below the, the prince's hand, but the prince's own blow and Puddleglum's both on its neck. Even that did not quite kill it, though. It began to loosen its hold on Rillian's legs and chest. With repeated blows, they hacked off its head. The horrible thing went on coiling and moving like a bit of wire long after it had died, and the floor, as you may imagine, was a nasty mess. The prince, when he had breath, said, Gentlemen, I thank you. 
Then the three conquerors stood staring at one another and panting without another word for a long time. I'm going to just show you the picture now. This is the prince battling the green serpent. So it wasn't actually the prince that turned into the serpent. It was, or sorry, the knight. The witch. It was the witch. All right. Jill had very wisely sat down and was keeping quiet. She was saying to herself, I do hope I don't faint or blub or do anything idiotic. My royal mother is avenged, said Rillian presently. This is undoubtedly the same worm that I pursued in vain by the fountain in the forest of Narnia so many years ago. All these years I have been the slave of my mother's slayer. Yet I am glad, gentlemen, that the foul witch took to her, took to her serpent from form at the last. It would not have suited well either with my heart or with my honor to have slain a woman. But look to the lady, he meant Jill. I'm all right, thanks, said she. Damsel, said the prince, bowing to her, you are of high courage, and therefore I doubt not. You come of a noble blood in your own world. But come, friends, here is some wine left. Let us refresh ourselves and each pledge his fellows. After that, to our plans. A jolly good idea, sir, said Scrub. That ends chapter 12. Chapter 13 is called Underland Without the Queen. And... JJ is asleep. The first word is all. The first word is all. Um, so we'll have to start that chapter tomorrow. I hope we'll see. I hope y'all are enjoying the story. What? Yeah, it was pretty exciting. Um, I hope that y'all are enjoying the story. Um and Ben was there for a bit, and I don't see him. I only see one little one person on right now. So it is what it is. Um, I hope that you guys have a good night, and we will talk to you later. God bless you, and we'll see you tomorrow. Goodbye.